الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد The title of my talk is Interpersonal Communication You know what that means? Great uh, And basically I, I'm required to touch upon a few things when it comes to communicating with other individuals you know So uh, I'm going to cover uh, so, uh, a kind of a broad spectrum of ways of communicating and just so that there's some benefit also throw in uh, like some kind of uh, like techniques as well uh, for for getting your point across or convincing people or offering advice now first of all there's obviously more than one way of communicating with someone and the way the style that you choose depends on a lot of things everybody with me the style of communication that you choose depends on a lot of things. It depends on, for example, the age of the person you're going to communicate with, whether they're male or female, the environment that you're communicating in. <clears throat> Am I in the middle of a quiet place or in the middle of a riot or, or like a rally or something like that? And also the relationship, the past relationship I have with this person. Is it uh, a sibling? Is it a parent to child, child to parent? Is it someone who knows me? Is it someone who sees me as credible? Is it someone, all these things, they affect, you know, the, the way and the technique we use in communicating and getting our point across to someone. So, uh, and a lot of times people expect that there's one way of communicating, but there are many ways and you would choose the way based on the situation, based on the person, based on the environment. So, of the first ones we wanted to look at, and there are actually a lot of questions have been coming in about aggression. You know, aggression in either in da'wah or in fixing a situation or in changing someone's behavior. Now, there are times, of course, when someone could be aggressive. For example, the father can be aggressive with the child. True? If he wants to be. Right? Yes or no? Yeah, he can. Huh. I don't know what, what happens in your house. You've been getting a lot of that, huh? You've been getting the, the belt, huh? All right. I like your father already. Um, so for example, but you know something? The youth can't be aggressive with their parents. And I know what happens, all right? You start to pray and go to the masjid regularly, attend a few classes. You read a few books here and there. And your parents are not practicing. So you have a beard, your father doesn't or you pray your mother doesn't so what happens you start to be aggressive with them because you know you've been wrong your whole life and they always correct you and now you're right about religion and they're wrong so now you're using this to your advantage and you want to come and you want to harass them and you want to make life miserable for everyone in the house and this happens a lot when someone becomes practicing he's so excited with the new information that they're discovering and when he or she receives new information, they act upon it immediately. So they assume that the parents will be in the same exact way. And then they go and present them with information and they don't accept it the same way. So what happens? Everything becomes a debate about religion. Every meal tends, turns to be a debate, an argument about religion. So breakfast, you argue about religion. Lunch, you bring up religion. Dinner, you bring up religion. And in the end, nobody wants to talk about religion anymore with you because the family got sick and tired of it and it always ends up with a fight you don't convince anyone and what happens is something that you may regret if you don't change is that you burn down that bridge and nobody wants to talk to you about religion anymore and and you can't give da'wah at the house these are the people who come to you three years later my family cannot accept anything about religion from me what do I do and I have to bring someone from the outside because you burnt them out don't be aggressive with your parents, people. Do not be aggressive with your parents. Because you have to understand something. <clears throat> when you weren't practicing, would you rather someone practicing would have come to you and approached you in an aggressive way and yelled at you and said, look at this and look at that, this is haram and that's haram? Or would you rather someone would have come to you gently and pulled you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And remember, this is something I have to say all the time. The definition of da'wah, it, it's from... The root to invite. An invitation is always nice. Nobody ever grabs you and invites you to dinner. Nobody you know, twists your arm and says, you want to have a dinner? And that's not, 
That's not the way it's done. So people invite you and whenever it's an invitation, it's gentle. Right? Every, all the time when it, someone's inviting, it's gentle. So if someone's inviting you to Islam, it can't be a fight. It can't be you fighting with your father, fighting with your parents about the religion. Or thinking you're better because you read a few books of hadith and now you're all that. And you're not. So it's not like that at all. But of course the father could use aggression and there could be even times when the da'i would be aggressive in da'wah. Can anyone think of examples when the Prophet ﷺ was aggressive in da'wah? Yeah, there were times like that. Remember when the Prophet you know, gave da'wah to Umar, right? But of course the news that reached him was that Umar was coming to kill the Prophet ﷺ. But when he entered, the Prophet ﷺ grabbed him and shook him. Some narrations of Umar said he's never been shaken like that. So this was a time when the Prophet ﷺ was aggressive. Also there was another time when the Quraysh were excessive in cursing and cussing the Prophet ﷺ. So he said something strong to them. But these are always exceptions. The general mode of da'wah is that it's very calm, it's very gentle. For even from the parent, if you want to guide your child towards Islam or guide them to an act of worship, it's not done through aggression and it's not done through forcing them to do things. And I know many people who came from families where the father was very strict and they hate certain aspects of worship and they link it back to a memory in, uh, in their childhood of how they were forced to do a certain action. I know of one father that wakes up all his sons and all his daughters for Qiyam. Qiyam, like night prayer. So what happens? He wakes them all up, they all get up, and he says Allahu Akbar and he starts to pray these long, long rak'at. And in the meantime, what happens? His, his sons, they stand behind him. When he says Allahu Akbar, they go sit on the beds. And some people will, will roll over and kind of sleep. And then when he is at the final tashahud, they all get up and sit behind him. He says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum. He turns, mashallah, all his children are behind him. He gets up again, Allahu Akbar, and they all go back to bed and they're sitting. This is a true family. I'm telling you this true story. Because he was forcing them upon that ibadah and they didn't want it. I know some people who hate waking up for fajr because of the way family members used to wake them up for fajr. Yeah, and he, he, this guy was telling me that he was sleeping. His grandfather woke him up for Fajr. He said, I went back to bed. He said his grandfather, he had um, a big uh, subha, you know, the ones they use for tasbih. He had a long one. He said his grandfather just came back, moved the cover, and he didn't care. He just whipped. It lands wherever it lands, no problem. And it landed on his stomach, and so it's not too bad, but still bad enough. Imagine you're sleeping and then somebody just whips you real hard on your stomach. So that's how he woke him up. So he hated that, you know. So also you find yani, sometimes they'll force small children upon fasting without explaining, without linking it to obedience to Allah. So even from the parents, the aggression towards the child in trying to get them to rectify their behavior or trying to get them to do something is not the best way. And it typically backfires. It typically backfires. Um, there's actually, uh, there's actually an example uh, that I always give, so I'll repeat it again, of how you, it, it's not good when you have people do something out of fear. You know how some people have argued that it's better to be feared than to be loved, which of course this is really incorrect. And if you read the seerah of the Prophet wasallam, you'll become convinced of this. It is not better to be feared than to be loved. Because if people only do things out of fear, then if you're not there, they won't do it. I'll give you a simple example. This even works for animals. All right? I'm going to give you an example with my cat, if you bear with me. All right? So I have this cat, and it used to like to sleep in the bedroom, but it was a long-haired cat, so the hair would be all over the place. So my roommate said, please don't let the cat into the bedroom. So he figured he's going to teach the cat to not go into the bedroom. Every time the cat would go into the bedroom, he would yell at it and the cat would run out. So I noticed then, when nobody's in, at, in the house, when I'm not there and he's not there, and I open the keys and I'm entering to the apartment, when I open the door, I see the cat running out of the bedroom pretending to be in the living room. Why? Because he's trying to teach it through fear to not go into the bedroom. But when nobody's there and there's nothing to fear, it goes into the bedroom. Similarly, those of you who, who own cats, sometimes the cat likes to jump up on the kitchen counter. So, 
most people, the way they would approach the cat, would just yell at it. It gets up on the counter, uh, it gets down. But when you're not there, guess what it's doing? It's rolling on the counter. It's having fun. It's do, you know making dough and bread and just having fun. So one way to actually, or two ways to teach the cat here is you know cats hate water. So just pour some water on the kitchen counter. And when you go and it jumps up, it's going and the cats hate water. It's going to get wet. It's going to hate that, and it's going to stop jumping up on the counter. Another one they tell you it's a bit more cruel and more fun. You take a thick piece of tape like packing tape and you put it sticky side up on the counter the cat jumps and it gets stuck and tangled in this tape you ever seen a cat stuck in tape it's fun they run around trying to get it off run run they think if they run fast the thing might leave stay behind them or something it's great uh, don't don't do that though uh, so then basically now even even with animals we're learning that it's not fear uh, it's not fear that's the best motivator and it's not fear that gets people to change their behavior so Parents also shouldn't use just fear all the time to get people to do the right thing to the child to do the right thing Even Allah Azawajal does not use fear all the time in the Quran Okay, a lot of people think there is probably more mention of the hellfire than there is of paradise in the Quran But that's not true because anytime the word yani, Nar appears in the Quran an equal number of times Jannah is mentioned in the Quran Anytime day is mentioned in the Quran, night is mentioned an equal number of times. Life is mentioned, death is mentioned an equal number of times. So does Allah motivate us using fear only? No. Sometimes Allah Azza wa Jal will tell us, uh, will tell us the punishment, that's fear of what happens or what, if you do something. Or He might tell us the reward for leaving something. Sometimes He'll tell us the reward for doing something. And then the punishment for leaving something. Or He might tell us stories of prophets. Or He might tell us benefit in this life. Or benefit in the next life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses many methods in the Quran to motivate us into action. And He doesn't only use fear subhanahu wa ta'ala. But realistically people are motivated by fear. And they are motivated by getting something good to happen to them. I'll ask you a simple question. Can you think of any animal that, or any human that does any action for no reason whatsoever? Probably without, you can't think of it. There is no action that's done for no reason whatsoever. So everything that any living thing does is typically to avoid some kind of potential harm or to bring some kind of good towards itself. You, you might argue, well, sometimes on Saturday, I just sit like this and I, on the couch and I just stare up and I don't do anything. Are you doing something or not? You, you said it, I think. You're, you're relaxing, all right? You're relaxing. Even if it makes no, the, you don't know the exact, there's no actual thing happening, you're still relaxing. There's nothing that's done for no reason. So because of that, it's realistic to say there is harm further down this road. And that would be a good motivator for people and for animals. Even a squirrel that would store food, it knows why it's doing that, to avoid potential harm. I don't know how sophisticated the thought is, you know. It doesn't say, well, well we're in uh, mid-July now and it's going to get cold. So I don't know if it does it like that, but it stores food out of fear of potential harm happening in the future. So, so now we're saying then aggression then is... Uh, is not like the this the default mode or the technique that you use when it comes to getting people to change or to motivate or even to communicate with people because when you are aggressive in communicating with someone you immediately turn them off and they become rigid so a person who would have listened to you because you were aggressive now they have become rigid and they're not willing to listen to you even if you bring them with good advice that's why one of the golden rules in da'wah they tell you if you start, if, if you're going to give someone advice about something, don't start by attacking something they love. Like for example, someone uh, smokes cigarettes, but he doesn't pray. So it makes more sense to call them to the salah than to attack what they love. And they love their cigarettes, they're addicted to their cigarettes. Or, you know, a young man or a young woman and they listen to music. You start attacking their music, don't ever attack their music. Just see what happens when Muslims are attacking. They attack Islam. In, in defense of their music. They attack Islam. So you don't attack something that people love. So generally when you become aggressive, you lose that individual and you lose out a great chance of changing that person. 
And of course, there are always situations where aggression may be the best thing. But it's not the norm, okay? It's not the norm. I'll tell you something. There was... Um, Okay, let me just not mention names nor places, but there was a man who went and sat down with a Muslim da'iyah. This man was a, a, a preacher. He went and sat down with a Muslim da'iyah. The da'iyah was very, very, very aggressive with him. And that man became Muslim. All right? And then he tells people, if that, if that man was not aggressive, I wouldn't have become Muslim. But does this mean we should use aggression as a general rule now? No, that was just an exceptional situation an exceptional situation okay so that's when it comes to being aggressive and be careful as in how you use this be be gentle with your parents be gentle with your loved ones because remember you you want people genuinely to be saved from the hellfire that's your whole point of talking to anyone so why would you be aggressive you might lose them at that point so be gentle with people invite them nicely and this is one of the things about changing the, mur, the munkar, the re, whatever reprehensible action you see, you have to change it as a Muslim, right? And we all know the hadith, very popular hadith. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man ra'a minkum munkaran falyugayyirhu bi biyadih. Fa in lam yastati' fa bilisanih. So whoever of you sees a reprehensible act or a munkar, something that's not right, he should change it with his hand. And if he can't change it with his hand, then with his tongue. And if he can't, then with the heart. And that's the weakest of Iman. So some people read this hadith, and it's a very popular hadith, but they understood that the hadith is saying, this is the order in which you change things. This is the order. The hadith is not talking about order. And the scholars say the instrument of change depends on who and what is being changed. And I remember this when I was a young man, many, many, many years ago. I was in a masjid and this, this one man did something and this other old grown man, okay, not old, but grown man, maybe early 50s or late 40s, smacked the other man, grown man. So the man says, why are you hitting me? The man said, the hadith said first with the hand, then with the tongue. So even if I'm able to speak to you, if I'm able to hit you, I'll duck you because that's what the hadith said. No. The hadith is not saying this is the order of things. The instrument of change will be based on who and what needs to be changed. So sometimes you can change something with your hand. But what if it involves destruction of property? Can you do it? Someone else's property. Can you change it with your hand? No. What if it, what if it involves يعني, that it's going to cost someone money if you destroy something? Can you do it? No. But a father, for example, can he change with his hand? If need be, and is it possible for him? You know the answer. Yeah. Right? Your father's going to fix a couple of munkarat tonight, I think. It's going to be great. So, the father, for example, if he felt the necessity and wanted to give the old backhand to the kid, absolutely, by all means. And he has my full support in doing so. So, that's a possibility. But you can't go into someone's house and you find that, for example, they have pictures hanging or little statues and start breaking them or anything like that. You're not allowed to do that or break someone's television as we discussed yesterday. So, the instrument of change depends on what or who is being, uh, is, it needs to be changed. And so, it's not the order that you start with the hand and then the tongue and then the heart. But typically, most of the situations will involve the tongue first, that you would speak to someone about changing the munka. Okay. So, when it comes then to communicating, sometimes there's something which is, which is really nice for, uh, and beneficial for us to know, known as rapport. Rapport. R-A-P-P-O-R-T. Rapport. And rapport basically is, that's really how it's spelled by the way. Some people are laughing like I'm being funny. So, rapport basically is when you establish some kind of relationship with someone. I'll give you some scenarios whether it involves Muslims or non-Muslims, basically, let's say there's a, a new security guard in your apartment complex. And you want to give him da'wah. But it's kind of weird that from his first day, you're going to walk up to him and start immediately doing anything about Islam and so on and so forth. So what you do, you establish rapport. 
So you start to talk to them first about the weather, you're new here, this and that, the parking, whatever situation. Now he knows you and you have some type of speaking relationship. And then maybe the second time also you just talk about something else. Third time now when you want to talk about Islam or something like that or give nasiha, it's not too sh sudden because you have already established some kind of relationship with this person. I'll give you now an example of rapport with Muslims. All right. And this is actually a true story. All right. Now, what happened was at the university uh, where I used to be in Virginia, in the third floor, there is the musalla where all the Muslims go to pray. And there is also in that, right next to the musalla, a bunch of Muslim young men and women who just sit there and play cards all day. All right. They just, you know, they're all giggling and they, they all lean on each other and they're, you know, mashallah, you know, uh, open and all the other. So they see people going to the musalla and they never get up and pray. So one time during one of the meetings, they brought it up because now we're, our job as the Muslim Students Association is to give da'wah to Muslims as well. So they're like, okay, we have these Muslims who sit right next to the musalla and none of them get up to go pray. So what are possible solutions we could come up with? So one of the brothers, and this is the actual solution he came up with. He said, I'm going to donate my time. And whenever it's time for salah, I'm going to go walk up to their table. This is on my way to the musallah. I'm going to walk up to their table. I'm going to look at them and I'm going to tell them all very sternly, as salah. This is how he's, mashallah, going to help us out with this problem. So Dohur, he's going to go to them. He's going to walk up to them and say, as salah. And then... Asr, he's going to come up to them and say, As-Salah. And then Maghrib, he's going to tell them, As-Salah. All right. So now this was the solution. Can you believe that or not? So, just this guy, big beard, nice frown, is going to walk up to them and say, As-Salah. Guess what? He's not going to be adding any new information to this group of people. They already know, they're Muslim, they know As-Salah. Because they're sitting on the third floor, on the way to the Musallah, they see around Duhur time, surprisingly, all these Muslims start going to that prayer area. And all the sisters start going to the prayer area. They wait there for about five minutes and they all come out. You think they don't know what happened? They know the people are praying. They know it's Duhur time. And then Asr time, they see all the people going towards the Musallah, staying there for a while praying and then coming out. So they know the people are praying Asr. So when you come and tell them, as -salah, you're not adding any new information whatsoever. It's not like they're going to be playing cards. You tell them, As-Salah. They're like, oh, oh, As-Salah? Oh, that's why all these Salah people, yallah. That's not, you're not adding new information. But what's interesting was in that uh, scenario, we had the quote-unquote religious people and then the non-religious people. And guess what? Was there any rapport between the two, any relationship, any communication? No. The only thing, the only communication between the two groups is this. You walk by, you look at them, and you frown. That's our da'wah to them. Alright? So you walk by, you see them, and then you go away. Can you imagine And he's being with that group, and you sit there, and every day about 50 or 60 religious Muslims will just come and walk away. So what's with religious people with the frowning? Every, they're just sitting there and people giving them dirty looks, dirty looks, dirty looks. And these dirty looks are going to tell them, Allah, ya khay, Allah, this is a beautiful religion. I want to become practicing so I can be like these people and give people dirty looks all the time. It's not going to work like that. So one of the things I suggested is, why don't we mend the relationship with these, estab establish some kind of relationship with them. Yani, imagine someone did this to them. So all the Muslim religious people and the good folks come by and give them these dirty looks, mm. intermingling, playing cards, not praying, haram, they go away. Imagine one of these religious people comes to them one time just with a bowl of candy and he gives everybody one. He gives them salam, how are you guys doing? What game are you playing? He's not even interested. But he asks them, what game are you guys playing? And they say, we're playing this game or that game. Then he goes away. And another time he'll come and he'll just chit chat with them, give them salam or give them, or pass around candy again. What do you think would happen in their hearts? They'll think, wow, most religious people just frown at us. But this guy, he's a religious person, but he's a nice guy as well. He comes and talks to us, he passes out candy, even though we're all intermingling. Taban, we're not saying he should sit and start playing cards with them, right? But just establishing some kind of rapport, some kind of relationship. Then you think if he comes to them one time and says, you know, 
You know, you guys are a nice crowd. I always like to come see you guys and give you salam. But I noticed you guys never come to the musalla. And I just wanted to, to tell you, come. You've seen the salah. It takes about five minutes tops. Just come pray and then come back to your game. What do you guys think? Do you think perhaps he stands more of a chance that he might get his, uh, a response to this da'wah? No doubt. Now, is it guaranteed that it may not, that it may work? No, it's not guaranteed. You know, and that's why um, and you try and you do your best and if it works, alhamdulillah. If it doesn't work, guess what? You still get your reward inshallah for that. Sometimes you follow all the rules and it doesn't work. I remember one time there was this sister in her hijab, she was very active with MSA and she started smoking. All right, and still in hijab, but she'd just be puffing away, always puffing away. And she stands out with a bunch of thugs in front of everybody, in front of the cafeteria. They're all smoking and being thugs and stuff. So the sisters told me, you know, you are kind of like her older brother. Inshallah, go give her advice. I said, okay. I followed all the rules of giving advice. You praise the other person. You recognize whatever good is in them. And I tried, I did all the rules, followed the rules to the T. Oh, she let me have it. She let me have it so bad that for the rest of the night, I was just like this. And my friends would tell me, what's wrong with you? I'm, I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay. She just went off. He said, you are not the imam here. Who do you think you are? And she just went, you know, the whole nine yards. So, uh, so of course it can backfire. Rapport may not work, I mean, but you do it. You try to have some finesse, some kind of diplomacy in your attempts and in your techniques. Now, so, you know, like we were saying earlier, that the earth that Allah created works through being balanced, and therefore the humans that Allah created to put on this earth also must work through a system of balance. And so you never want to be too far on any end of the spectrum. The, the middle is always what will work best. So the middle is that you're, you know, you're kind, you're gentle, and you're between being aggressive and between being too passive and too weak and not able to speak out or say anything. And sometimes people confuse being oh, very passive with being uh, having haya or having modesty. And there is a difference between the two. So, uh, and it's not necessarily also just being humble, but uh, allowing yourself to be humiliated by others. Not when you humble yourself for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, because the Muslim always high, uh, holds him or herself in high regard, right? Because this is what we call izzah. You feel honored, you feel the dignity and honor that Allah Azza wa Jal made you a Muslim. So you do not lower yourself and in abase yourself and humiliate yourself in that sense. But again, it's always a good balance between, you know, uh, whatever two extremes of emotions or forms of communication, Always the balance is what will work. There will be exceptional cases, and then in that case, that's when you use it appropriately. But for the most part, always the middle. Love and hate, for example. Oh, um, love and hate. Uh, you'll find people also going to extremes in loving and in hating. And in Islam, it's not necessarily always black and white. You can hate something about someone and love something else in them. So, for example, let's say. There is um, a brother who gives a lot in charity. He's one of the, the best people when it comes to helping the poor, the needy, the masjid. He gives a lot. But he has some other bad traits. So most people, and I know, especially young people, they either just want to love him or hate him. And most of the time they'll choose to hate him. But in Islam you can actually love him for his generosity and dislike the certain bad thing about him. So there can be gray. It's not just black and white and this is again the middle path when it comes so someone you know does some bad deeds and everything but they have one good deed you can love him for that one good deed and hate the bad deeds about him and it's not that we just go around hating everyone because the bad overweighed the good or things like that but there's always any there's you're taught to always look for that light yeah but I, I think I've gone over I was supposed to do some uh, some Q&A at the end uh, but um, so, uh, of course, uh, let, me, let, me, um, let me mention also that even then, even with, with trying to be peaceful the whole time, there will always be an extreme situation 
where you would go to the to the other end. Yani for example, in Islam, the Islam because it's realistic, it does recognize times when you have to defend yourself. And sometimes defending yourself would be physical, self-defense, right? Even though you're supposed to be gentle and you're not supposed to fight. But that's also more realistic than telling you to turn the other cheek all the time. That also is not realistic. So for example, if you if someone enters into your home, they start slapping around your children, you know, and the father's not just gonna sit back and say, Oh, your son, turn the other cheek. It might be in your case, right? The father would be like, Yeah, actually I was gonna give him a beating anyway, so go ahead. <laughs> But for the most part, this is a time when the father will go and, and want to defend the person here. Because it's not realistic to expect people to turn the cheek or turn the other cheek all the time. And that's why I'm telling you, every time in Islam you will find things to be very balanced. It's not just one way or the other. But for the most part, the middle path is what's best uh, and chosen for us. There will be extreme situations when you go to this end or you go to the other end. Type. Uh, how about I stop here, uh, Abdul Wahid? Huh? Okay. All right. Khair. So we'll stop here and take uh, uh, some questions. Inshallah, Jazakum Allah Khair. Al-Husn Istimaakum. Sallallahu Muhammad wa ala sahbihi